welcome to a very cold and foggy winter's day in Melbourne, where today the question is, is this car behind me the ultimate wolf in sheep's clothing? Is it the ultimate Q car? Now, you probably guessed that this is a Volkswagen Golf R. In fact, you clicked on the link, you're watching the video, you know it is. But if you're not in the know, then the car behind me could very well be a $25,000 Golf. What we want to know is, is it worth three times that, $73,000 on the road? Is this Golf worth that money? Secondly, is it worth $13,000 more than the, let's admit it, already capable and fast Volkswagen Golf GTI? That's what we're gonna find out. But before we do, do us a favor, hit the like button and subscribe so that when Drive drives new cars, you hear about it first. First, let me run you through the exterior changes that the Golf R gets that elevates it over lesser models. And from the front, I think you'd agree there's a real air of menace about it. That's probably down to those Matrix LED headlights. That's a first for a Golf. It's also got a deeper front spoiler with those very Formula One style upticks in it. And of course, behind that bonnet is the very familiar EA888 two litre turbocharged four cylinder engine which we've been driving since, can you believe it, the mid 2000s. But in this car, it's been modernized and we'll get to that shortly. From the side, we can see 19 inch lightweight alloy wheels, which despite their extra size, lower the ride height thanks to sports suspension overall by about five millimeters. The only other side changes, we've got matte chrome wing mirror caps and that's about it. Oh, the fuel filler down the end there, which we're going to be feeding 98 RON because that's what it needs to do 235 kilowatts and 400 Newton meters. And at the rear, this is where the Golf advertises its R performance loudest. You can see we've got a big rear wing up the top. We've also got a deep diffuser for channeling air out from under the car. And we've got quad tailpipes, whether that's for four cylinder engine four motion all wheel drive underneath, or just four letters in the word golf. Take your pick. Okay, now that we've done the exterior, let's have a look at the interior. And since I'm standing at the boot, I'm gonna start with the boot. And I can't wait to get inside the car because it is cold right now. Okay, boot, classic Volkswagen opening, but you've got to do it yourself. $73,000 car, no electric opener. 374 liters, Volkswagen Golf, what did you expect? 60-40 split fold, takes it out to 1,230. And you don't have a spare tire under there because it can't fit a 19 inch wheel. Now to the back seat. Okay, into the back seat. Now the door openings aren't the biggest in the world and it does feel like you're getting into quite a cramped interior. But once you're in, it's actually quite roomy. I think you can see here, that's my driving position. I've got very good room here for my knees. Under seat foot room is generous. And headroom, no complaints for me. Now, what else have we got here? We've got map pockets down here. We've got a couple of phone pockets up here, nice and thoughtful. We've also got our own climate control in the back. And on a cold day, that's pretty good. Plus, there's two USB ports down the bottom. In terms of drink holders, in the door I've got a big bottle holder, in the armrest I've got a couple of cup holders, and if you left your esky in the boot, you can reach right through and get it. But apart from that, and ISOFIX ports in the outboard seats, there's not much else to report. Now the front seats are where it's at in the Golf R. This is, after all, a driver's car, and here we are at the helm. Looking around the cabin, it is very similar to the Golf GTI. It's got that Spartan interior that they debuted on the current generation Golf. And it's taking me a while to re-familiarize, which is actually surprising because I drove the Golf GTI late last year. But once you do figure things out, and once you realize you've got four shortcut buttons here and you can drag down from the top to get other shortcuts, everything you need is within easy click. If you don't like that, this car has gesture control, so you can adjust things that way or good old fashioned talk to the car. Well, that's not really old fashioned, is it? Hey Volkswagen. There you are. Make this car warmer. Sorry, music selection is currently unavailable. Please try again later. Maybe it doesn't understand English. Hey Volkswagen. Turn on the seat heater. 
air conditioning functions cannot be operated by voice control. Wow, I'm not having much success here. Hey, Volkswagen, play the Australian national anthem. Sorry, music selection is currently unavailable. Please try again later. I don't know whether to surrender or keep going. One more, we'll try one more. Hey, Volkswagen, what can you do? Call contact. Please connect a phone via Bluetooth first. Please remember that you should not use your mobile phone while the vehicle is in motion. Thank you, thank you very much for that reminder. I guess I need to go back to the manual to learn how to talk to the car. Now there are a few other things I want to cover in this interior. Big differences between GDI and Golf R are these beautiful Nappa leather sports bucket seats and an R embossed into the logo. What else have we got here? We've also got a wireless phone charging mat and it does wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which is fantastic. But I'm having a bit of trouble getting the phone to charge wirelessly. I've got a Google Pixel 6 and I put it in there and it keeps telling me every 10 or 20 seconds that it's found a phone and it will start charging. I don't know if it's actually charging, but it becomes annoying after a while. Maybe that is a quirk of the Google rather than the car. I'll cut it some slack there. You also heard we've got heated seats in the front and ventilated, fully electrically adjustable with memory function. The steering wheel is not electrically adjustable. That's old school. What's definitely not old school is this infotainment and driver instrument binnacle. And that's the other area where the Golf R steps things up. You have, by pressing the view button here, a dedicated Golf R instrument cluster, which actually looks pretty cool. And then when we dive into here and we're driving, let's actually go the shortcut, we'll go mode. We've got a whole bunch of modes which adjust the car's suspension and drivetrain. Comfort, sport, race. When you press on race, you get drift mode, which we're only driving on public roads today. Sorry, we're not going to test that. And special mode, which is actually titled Nürburgring mode. Now what that does, it sharpens all the drivetrain, so you get much faster gear changes on your DCT, you get much better throttle response, and I've got to tell you, we're going to find out how quick that is a bit later on, but you get, and this bit I like, slightly softer than race suspension. The Nürburgring is renowned for being a fast racetrack, but also a bumpy one, and they've customised it so that when you're on the road and you want that compliance, but you also want a sharp drivetrain, that's exactly what you get, which means... Let's go for a drive. Hey Volkswagen, turn off the music. Okay. Yes, I knew I'd figure that out finally. All right, enough of that crap. What's this car like to drive? So I've started off in comfort mode, so everything is at its most compliant. Let's call this commuting mode. And I've got to tell you, it's a pretty comfortable car to drive around in. First thing I'm noticing is it is firmer, slightly firmer in the ride than I recall from the GDI and a fair bit firmer than the mainstream Golfs. But honestly, I'd actually feel ripped off if it wasn't. I would expect it to be more taut when it's going over undulations and whatnot. And look, it handles bumps absolutely fine. So I've got no complaints at all. It feels a tiny bit sporty, even when I'm in this boring mode. And I kind of like that. I want to know what I've got waiting for me if I want to get serious. Throttle response is pretty good. It's a bit doughy, I'll be honest. It's, it does respond, but it takes a bit of a concerted push. Again, I guess that's probably what you want from commuter mode. Um, steering, relatively light, but it has a bit of heft to it, so I don't mind that. When I crank things up a bit, which I'll do by pressing the R button on the steering wheel, Actually, it's chucked me into race mode, but I'm going to dial it back one. We'll go into sport mode. Steering still feels the same. Throttle does feel a bit sharper. And from memory, the transmission's going to be a bit more responsive and change gears a bit faster when, when I put the throttle down a bit more. Which, it oh, oh, that was interesting. I felt the front end really start to turn me around that corner as I push the throttle in, and that's that four motion system. Now you guys will remember that the previous generation 4Motion was smart enough to apportion torque across the front axle, but when it came to throwing it to the rear axle, it just threw it back there and let the rear wheels figure things out. And that's why when you really got aggressive with the throttle, 
you got a bit of that understeer, a bit of push, because the rear axle was basically just pushing you forward. This new generation actually uses its smarts to feed individual rear wheels. It's got a clutch pack back there that helps you figure out which rear wheel could do with the torque. So when you're hooking into a corner, it pushes more torque to the outside rear wheel, which in turn helps push you round the corner, not push you wide out of the corner. And I can tell you now that we've cranked things up to sport mode, I can feel that happening. It doesn't feel as nose heavy as the previous generation. Okay, now let's get serious. Let's dial up race mode. And we'll go for Nürburgring rather than drift. But wow, race mode, I can feel the difference straight away. Steering's firmer, it's a bit heavier. I don't know if I like that. It was pretty good in the other mode, but let's see how it goes. I can hear the engine a lot more. I can feel the bumps in the road a lot more. And I can also feel the rear end really helping to pull me around the corners. It's like it's dialed that intensity right up. There is still a bit of understeer there if you push, but this car has come alive. This is what it's all about. Yeah, this is when I can start to feel why you might want to pay $70,000 for what is basically a hot hatch. Actually, I think that's being a bit unfair, calling this car a hot hatch, when that brings to mind, you know, Peugeot 205 GTI and previous generation Golf GTIs, this Golf R is in another league. The smarts going on underneath it even on a wet day like today, is really giving me confidence in this car. And when you come out of a corner, the punch is just phenomenal. I know I said earlier this engine is almost 20 years old, but I'm not complaining. It feels as good today as pretty much any other I've driven. Still, $73,000? That is a lot of money, isn't it? Let's have a think about that for a bit. So our time with the Golf R is drawing to a close, which means I need to come up with a conclusion. Now, normally on an inclement, wet, slippery day like today, I would say that it's very hard to be definitive, but in a weird way, the conditions today have actually helped me experience the Golf R's more advanced four motion powertrain in conditions where it can really show what it's capable of. And honestly, I am left stunned at how good it is. It has gone a long way to banishing the demons of understeer that plagued earlier generations. The way it can use either rear wheel or both rear wheels in proportion to propel you round corners instead of just push you wide on corners is really quite phenomenal. I mean, yes, the tires are part of that solution but at the end of the day you can have all the power in the world but if you can't get it to the right wheels at the right time the tires can't do anything about that this golf r is a phenomenon i can see now why it's such a good car is there a car that can beat it i don't know do i want to find out 100 percent do i want to drive it on a dry track or a dry road Absolutely, but I'm not going to have the chance this time. Would I pay $73,000 for it? That's the big question. Can I afford it? No. Do I want to be able to afford it? Hell yes. It is an awesome car. That powertrain, yes, I know the EA888 is almost 20 years old. It doesn't feel like it. It is so generous and so surging with its turbocharged power. You just want to keep hitting that throttle. The different drive modes, I just want to spend the whole time in race. I don't care it's too firm, I'll put up with that so that I've got razor sharp responses whenever I want them. My problem now is that this car has to go back, which means my time with it is done. My challenge is to figure out another article that I can do so I can get to drive it again. And if you want to see what happens when we do get to drive it again, remember to subscribe to drive on YouTube and hit the like button so that my boss sees I'm doing a good job and he might let me drive this car again. And if you want to find out if there are any flaws or any other things with this car, they're not major, but I have detailed them in the article that goes with this review. 
So check out drive.com.au for more. And until next time, I'm out of here.